is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show. Where dad is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, host of The Ken Coleman Show, talking about careers and jobs, is my co-host today. So if you want to talk careers and jobs, this is a good time to do it for sure. The phone number is 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. 5225. Ken, your show on now 75 plus radio stations and Sirius XM and a popular podcast has become the perfect one two punch because 90% of my work has been on the outgo side, but there's two sides of this financial equation. The income side is the other side. I don't get to talk about that enough, and you being in the marketplace teaching people that uh, your income and doing work that matters and doing work that with your life that you care about um, is part of the equation of building wealth. That's absolutely right. It turns out that when you do something that you're really good at and that you love, you get promoted more because you are an attractive candidate, an attractive team member because the leader says, wow, you know, this person is clearly doing what they were born to do. We want to give them more stuff to do. You know, a happy and an enthused, you're, you're an employer. When you see somebody that's on fire, you've talked about this a lot. We want to hire those people because yeah. you said yeah, you one of my favorite Davisms, and I don't know if it's yours, by the way, but you can't light wet wood. Isn't that how you say yeah, it? It's not a. I, yeah, I stole it, but yeah. We'll yeah, get you, it. Can't, okay. you can't. You can't. I mean, <laughs> it's really hard to light wet wood. It I mean, is. And, you know, I was. I'm burned out. It's impossible. You were never on fire. <laughs> right. You know. I mean, so. You know, it's yeah. just you, you got to get. You know, if yeah. you're happy, notify your face. Yeah. I mean, you ought to be yeah. doing something with your life yeah. that you love and that you're engaged with. Right. And sometimes, if you that means changing from yes. what you're doing, and um, you know, you have the seven steps to getting to yeah. a career. Yeah. Uh, that that you love and that you're passionate about, and the first one is to get clear. The second one is to get qualified. Yes. And getting qualified can mean uh, if you're going to open a lawn care business uh, that you uh, reach over and pull the uh, pull the thing on the mower and get get the engine started. That's, That's qualified. Right. Um, you get your button gear right. Uh, but can, qualified could be getting a PhD. Could be. Uh, if if you're going to be um, or, or getting your MD. If you want to be a sure. medical doctor, getting qualified, there's only one way to do that. That's right. And that's go through med school. So, you know, that, that step while people are working to get out of debt sometimes throws them. It does because they're sitting there going, okay, wait a second. I'm gazelle intense. I'm trying to get out of debt. And we don't stop that. But what we have to look at is we have to first determine what does it look like to get qualified. So we ask the question, what do I need to learn? What do I need to do? That's education and experience. How much is that going to cost me? There's a cost of time. And then obviously, if you got to spend some money to get qualified, and then you say, okay, based on those answers, I've got a plan here. Well, I'm getting out of debt. And there are many times where you must get your financial house in order, walk the baby steps out, because here's the good news. That dream career is still going to be there. The, the, the ability to get qualified is still going to be there. And many times, though, we see people can cash flow their way through it because a certification may be something that you can do. Uh, it might just be that you don't need any kind of new education, that you just got to make some connections. And people say, you know what? You've got some raw talent. We're willing to train you on the job. We're seeing this with companies as large as Google, where they are doing on the job training so getting a clear picture about what what i actually need to get qualified then we can go oh it may not cost me as much as i thought and and people you know uh, that that with the epic student loan crisis Mm -hmm. and with the shutting down of colleges during covid uh universities during covid people started to really start to look at higher education but too many people still have in their brain that if i don't have an mba that's table stakes for me to do what I want to do. And it's it's just not. Simply not true. It's just not. There's a few things that are table stakes. There are a few things you've got to put that chip on the table in order to keep stay in the game. That's right. In order to get to the table, stay in the game. And But there's very few things that are real table stakes. Uh, but people put that up, and it's really an artificial barrier. It is. 
I've got two questions that I ask callers on this show, on the Ken Coleman show to consider when they say, do I need the next level of edu- education? The first question is, is it the only way? So let me give you two examples that everybody gets. If you want to be a lawyer, you got to have a law degree. You just do. If you want to be a doctor, you got to have a med school degree. Those are a couple of examples that we all get. So you got to look at what you want to do and you got to truly do the research. And, and then you say, is this the only way to get the ticket to the dance? And if it's not, then you ask yourself, is it the best way? Okay. And if it's not the only way or the best way, wait a second. That means there are multiple ways. And let's look at that. You well, and I have talked and, about and this. The best way could be, I can't afford it. That's exactly right. So I've got right. to find the other way because this is the way broke people do it. That's right. I'm going to cash flow my yeah. way through it. Yeah, and I'm good with that. I've That's done that exactly most of my right. life on a whole bunch of things. The best way is just go buy a brand new one. No. You know? But maybe not. Maybe the uh, best way if you're too broke to do that because you don't have any money because you've been buying all the brand new That's ones. That's right. Then maybe you need to buy a used one before you buy a That's new right. one. And see, that's where the baby steps come in. So the best way for many people is let's get to baby step three, right? Mm-hmm. Let's, let's get there and then let's go, all right, what do we do now? Can I now, because I've got my emergency fund in place, can I begin to cash flow getting qualified? And here's the other thing, Dave. I know there's this, there's this desire in all of our, our, our humanness to just make progress as much as we can. But the thing is, is that if you walk the baby steps out, then get to the place where you can cash flow your way to get qualified, you may take a little longer to get in that dream gig that you've always wanted, but it's actually going to feel wonderful. You're not going to be in a nightmare scenario where we have a lot of dentists or you just pick the career where they're doing it, but they're underneath a mountain of debt. It's not worth it. If that dream becomes a nightmare then. We interviewed a dentist in uh, the Borrowed Future podcast. Yes. That between student loans and buying the practice, had over a million dollars in debt, and he had just gotten into the practice. Yeah. And his lip is quivering. Absolutely. And tears running down his face as he's describing the yeah. crap he'd gotten himself into. And so, yeah, what, we, what we've learned to do over the years at Ramsey is to teach you, yes, the Ken Coleman way to do careers is there. And yes... You can walk the seven clear steps to getting the career you love. And yes, you can do that. And it's not incongruent with building wealth. It's not incongruent with staying out of debt. It's not incongruent with any of those things. Uh, As a matter of fact, it's highly congruent. Uh, Absolutely. It's actually the best way to do it. Tonight, we are doing a live stream event. I assume our studio audience is sold out. We have a small studio audience of a couple we of hundred. We do. I think we're sold out, you know. But a couple if of hundred coming in yeah, here. Yeah, it's going to be fun. You might be able to sneak in here if you ask somebody at the door real nice. I or might walk out and get some people in. You yeah, know. you never know. But uh, <laughs> anyway, if you're feeling stuck or you're disengaged from your current job, you dread getting out of bed, going to work in the morning, you're searching for a new job for any reason, the Get Hired live stream is tonight with Ken Coleman, April the 27th. It's for you. It's only $30, and uh, you can text HIRED to 337. 337- 89 and get your tickets text hired to 33789 i highly recommend if you have any idea that you might want to be doing something different that you watch ken tonight he's going to walk you very clearly through exactly what to do you're going to leave inspired laughing crying and believing you can win this is the ramsey show Hey folks, I got a great option to help you pay for your education. The Army National Guard. The Army National Guard believes you are the next greatest generation because you have proven that even in adversity, that you have what it takes to succeed. That's why they offer benefits like tuition assistance, career training, and a paycheck to help you avoid debt. No matter what your goals are, the Army National Guard can help you get there. Visit nationalguard.com to find out more.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. I am Dave Ramsey, your host. This is a show about you, America. It's about your life, your money, your career, your mental health, your marriage, your money, your life, your career, your mental health, your marriage. It's about you. Celeste is with us. She's going to start off this hour in Tucson, Arizona. Hi, Celeste. How are you? Hi. I'm doing well. How are you guys? Better than I deserve. How can we help? Um, so really quickly to the point, well, first of all, thank you for all that you do, and thank you for having me on. Um, so to the point, I am at a very, very toxic work environment right now. Um, so I'm kind of just what you were talking about. You know, I get up and I don't want to go to work. I get up and I'm I'm dreading going. I, I hate being there. It, it's gotten to the point that I just want to quit, and I'm not a quitter, so it's a very difficult time and, like, season of my life right now. Um, however, they do pay for school. And so I'm four classes away from getting my bachelor's. However, this past, I was supposed to graduate in May. Um, and it just, you know, um, a lot of things, a series of events just happened and it didn't happen for me. Um, I'm now at the point where I'm stuck at this job until October 26th. There's no um, transferring for me. There's no moving up, nothing. Um, I was initially only there because they pay for school. But at this point, I just, I, I need something that's going to make me happy. I have the money to pay for my summer classes. However, I'm I'm trying to pay everything off. I finished baby step one, and I don't want to continue using the money that I'm saving to pay for school when I have school paid for if I stay here. But I, I don't know what to do. What is the um, nature to- of the toxicity? What's the problem with this place? Um, I, I just, I don't grow. I have no growth. Um, there's that's not no to- communication. That's not toxic. There's no support. That's not toxic. There's no support. That's not toxic. Okay. What's toxic? There's no um, support and you're not growing. You're in a dead end job. It's boring. whoop de doop That ain't toxic. Okay. So it's tell me what, tell me very, what's toxic. Is somebody, is there sexual things going on? Are people yelling and screaming and cussing? Or is somebody throwing things at you? Um, are they, you know, discriminating against you in some way? I mean, what's, what's toxic? Well, no, it's not all of that. No, you're right. But it is, it's, no one speaks to me. I go in, I say good morning, no one talks to me. But that's, you know, that is me complaining. I should just go and do my job. That's what I'm there for. However, there's just no support. I can't, I can't go talk to someone. They're not letting me know. They're not asking me, hey, like, how are you? And I don't know if that's maybe me just complaining, but no, no. I'd like to go to a place that listen, I Listen, the job sucks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't have any doubt. I mean, you're kind of like, it sounds like Office Space, the movie, you know? <laughs> yeah, Celeste, first of all, uh, Dave's asking the right question. We want to get to the to the source of toxicity so that you can get the right frame of mind. Uh, but I'm going to tell you right now, you're dealing with something that happens in offices all across the country and all across the world, and you're just underappreciated. People want to know, am I seen? Am I valued? And that's not fun. And Dave's right. It sucks. But let's reframe your perspective, all right? Let's just go through this very quickly. You're four classes away from getting the bachelor's, which is why you took the job. So what's the new timeline if you stay at this company so they pay for the four classes? Is that what I heard? October? October 26th, wasn't it? October 26th. Okay, great. So I'd hang in there until October 26th. This is an attitude change. This is, hey, I'm grateful for this really boring place because this boring place is giving me the opportunity to step up to the next rung on the ladder in life. And and I can hang out. What you're learning here is how never to lead when you have the opportunity to lead. You have Mm anti-mentors. They're teaching you how not to do crap. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, but, but if they're not being nasty to you or breaking the law or you know, asking you to do something that's immoral or that kind of stuff, uh, then it's just a matter of they, they, it's a dead end job. It's boring. And they're not the nicest bunch of people in the world. They don't, they're not very friendly. If that's the whole version of toxicity, you stick this out, you suck it up and stick it out. Yep. Get your mind on the future. Pay for it then? No, I have the money to pay for it. I just, I don't want to because I'm trying to save my money. I'm trying to pay off my debt. Yeah. I'm only eleven thousand off stay of my Stay on the baby debt. steps. Well, I don't know if just yeah. got it. Stay with stay with what you're doing. Yes. Let them pay for it and finish. It's it's listen. It's part. You know, you're going to school, 
And I can guarantee you, you've gone to some classes that are taught by a tenured professor who's boring as crud and not a very good teacher. And that desk hurts by the time you get out of it. I've sat in those stupid classes. Mm -hmm. And you're doing you're putting up with that toxic stuff, in quotes, in order to get a degree, in order to further your life. You're delaying the pleasure. You're putting up with some pain to win later. Does that make sense? It does. I just feel like I'm delaying the the chance to leave this job if I were to just pay for well, it. If you can leave the job and paid. someone will give you a job that pays for your education, that's all thrilling and they affirm you every day, have at it. I'm actually going to push back, Celeste. I don't think you're delaying your exit from this boring job. You're del If you leave, you're delaying getting into the next baby step. Don't use that money when they've, they're going to pay you. How old are you? I just turned 24. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I have an older brother and a younger brother. You're the middle. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. All right. I, yeah, I, I still, I, um, you can do whatever you want. You're a grown person if you want to quit and spend your money. But basically, you are writing a check to, in order to get away from these people. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. And I, I don't hear anything here that's worth writing a check for. Um, n you know, 68% of Americans are dissatisfied at work. Is that right? It's absolutely right. It's close and, to 80 uh, around the world. And so that means that uh, uh, at least half of those are experiencing something along the lines of what you are experiencing. Because most people aren't leaders. Most people are bosses. That's exactly Mo right. Most organizations don't affirm. Most organizations don't communicate. Most organizations suck. And that's why most people don't like working there. And so, uh, but toxic is when something's happening to you that's abusive. Yes. And you're not being abused, kiddo. Yeah. You're just not being affirmed and it's dead end and it's boring. Yeah. You got to change your mindset here. It's, wait a second, I'm grateful for the money to get out of, to, to get the schooling I need while I'm getting out of debt. It needs to be a total shift. We know this from neuroscience. Well, I, I worked in a place in my 20s one time that everybody in the building, it seemed like, right. was sleeping with each other. Oh. It was a dadgum. Soap opera. Yeah, yeah. That's a nice way of saying it. Yeah. Um, and it was just nuts. I mean, and I'm in the middle of this thing and I'm going, this is gross. And, you know, what? The, I was only there for about five months before I got moved on, right? And, and But it was one of my first few jobs coming out of college, and you go through some situations like that. But you know what I learned from that? You know, that, that was 30-something years ago. I'm sitting here talking about it. Mm -hmm. What I learned from that is I'm not going to tolerate a situation like that. But, and I'm not going to, now that I'm in a position to control it, I'm not going to have a whole bunch of people inside our building that are running around like it's some kind of orgy or something. Yeah. This is nuts. And so people do this, though, in the workplace, and but not ours, and, you know, not there. And we're not, you know, it's not who we are. And, and so then a young lady or a young man could come to work here of character, and they can feel safe. Where, you know, that and now that's toxic. Yes. But, but, you know, but I still, I, I didn't walk out the door and quit that day. I endured it for a while. But what yeah. I got from the endurance was the lesson to make sure it never happens in my environment. Quick thing here, folks. We see what we focus on. We know this. They've done all types of neuroscience studies on this. When you buy a car and you get excited about that car purchase, how many of you see it everywhere for the first six, seven days? It's because there's an intense focus on it. When you focus on being a victim, you will see victimization everywhere you go as opposed to going wait a second i'm so close to being debt free and i'm with getting my school paid for with a degree and all i gotta do is put up with boring awful leadership until october i can do that yeah that's yeah. you gotta change. wait till christmas to open your gifts too <laughs> i hate that day i do no discipline seems pleasant at the time but it yields a harvest of righteousness this is the ramsey show is full of firsts. As the 
first and longest serving Christian health cost sharing ministry, CHM has shared medical expenses for its members since 1981. We believe you should have the freedom to focus on your health while being supported by a community of believers, giving you the opportunity to create many more firsts. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. This is The Ramsey Show. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Landon is with us in Memphis. Hi, Landon. Welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hey, I appreciate you taking my call. Sure, man. What's up? So I'm 24. My wife is 22, and we'll have our house paid off in five months. Yeah! And yeah, I appreciate it. But um, so after we pay off our house, we want to save up and pay cash for rental real estate. And I was just curious on your opinion on if we should. And I grew up in real estate. My parents do in real estate. So I was just curious on your opinion on if we should maybe just kind of start out by doing a couple of small flips or if we should just kind of go straight into real, you know, rental real estate. And I, I just kind of wanted your opinion on that. Well, flips are real when you're doing them with cash. You can make money. Right. Uh, and with your background in it, I, I, if I woke up in your shoes, I would do some flips. I've used to, that's how I used to make a living when I was your age. And mm -hmm. so, uh, I was so stupid. I did it with debt back then, but, um, uh, you know, now, um, you know, here's the trick. Okay. And you already know this, but I need to say it out loud to make sure all of America hears it. Uh, people doing flips off of what they see on an infomercial or read in some kind of stupid book uh, lose their butts. Mm -hmm. In the real world, on a flip, you are going to look at 200 properties to buy one. Right. Because you got to steal it. There's no margin. Right. If you're paying 80% of value, you're going to break even. Right. Minus repairs. So our our formula when we were doing flips was seventy percent of value minus minus repairs, and so um, you know if the property was a hundred thousand dollar property for easy math that means I'm going to pay seventy if there's ten thousand dollars worth of repairs I'm going to pay sixty, right. and it takes a while to get at that. Oh by the way you're in a ridiculously hot real estate market where any stupid thing that comes on the market sells instantly, and so you're going to have a hard time finding deals right now. Sure. I suspect Memphis is the same way as the rest of the nation. I don't know, but there's a well, I'm about an hour outside of Memphis, and so it, the market's not quite as crazy as Memphis is, and so you know it, it's a little bit easier, but it's you know it's still you know the the, the white hot market. Yeah, but the the bottom line is that you make your money on the buy if you're doing flips or if you're doing long term investing. Either one, you make your money on the buy, meaning you're going to get a deal or you don't buy it, and. Right. That means you cannot get emotional. You cannot get fever like, ooh, ooh, this money's burned a hole in the pocket. I got to buy something. I got to buy something. I got to buy something. The first property I ever flipped, I was 22. I made $832. I barely mm -hmm. got out mm -hmm. because I was an idiot, and I paid way too much for it. I bought a HUD foreclosure, and I thought because it said foreclosure, that meant bargain. It doesn't. The number means bargain, not the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. And so, if you'll if you'll stick to the math and put some business practices in place that guarantee profit, and you'll do some flips with cash, it's also probably going to be very hard in this current situation. But I love the concept, and I made a lot of money doing it. Uh, but it's uh, it, it's most people don't have the patience or the diligence to look through enough deals to get a real deal. And uh, and they get emotional, and they get oh I've got a I'm a real estate investor now, and then they just go buy something and they do something stupid. Yeah, I love that formula the seventy percent of market then the expenses itself, and then I don't know if this young man can do it, but if you've got the skills, like my father-in-law, he's got the skills. He's a contractor. He can go in and do save a lot of on that actual expense budget too. You know where well, some people you, are getting crushed by but that, a contract. But here's the thing: you you don't want to. 
Uh, you you want to budget it out as if you paid a contractor? Because if you're going to do the work, exactly. you ought to get paid profit on the deal, Great and point. you ought to get paid for being a contractor. I love that. If you're going to be in there swinging a hammer, don't do it free. That's right. You're going to be on a business end of a paintbrush, be, pay, be, <laughs> be paid painter's wages, and make your profit, too. Yeah. That's a great form. Yeah, you don't want to say, oh, I'm going to pay them more for this house because I don't have the level of expense. That means you got paid zero for your labor. Great, great point there. You don't want to do that. So, uh, But I made the decision. I can swing a hammer. I can fix anything. But I made the decision even at 22 that I was going to run, run crews to do it uh, because I, my highest and best use was not on the business end of a paintbrush. It was getting the next deal. And, um, you know, hunting the next deal. I make more money hunting the next deal than I did painting houses. Yep. Otherwise, I'd just be painting houses. See, that's a great point, too. So know what you do best. What do you do best for you? Well, where's the, you know, the highest and best use? You know, what's your best return on the doll, on the time spent? Dollar return on the time spent. How much per hour are you making looking for deals? How much per hour are you making painting houses? And that that's the difference, and that's what you get into. So you got to – it is nice to be able to do the stuff, and that way when the crew leaves in the middle of the job, you can jump in there and finish it out because you, you hired some bozo to do the work. Um, not that that's ever happened to me, but um, – Anyway, <laughs> no emotion on that sentence at all. No sarcasm yeah. dripping off of the tongue. Jake is in Boise, Idaho. Hi, Jake. How are you? Good, Dave. Thanks, Dave and Ken, for taking my call. Sure. How can I help? So, yeah, our question is, uh, I have a promotion opportunity that's causing us to, to move from eastern Idaho over to Boise. Uh, we stand to make about 140000 in the sale of our home. And we're wondering if we should take that 140000 and put it into our new home or if we should pay off our debt and live with the in-laws for a year um, and then buy a home after that. How much debt have you got? We've got about 80000 uh, 35 in student loans. So why couldn't you put sixty down in, on in cars. We could. Uh, we've got... Uh, five of us, my wife and I, and three kids, and so uh, a home in Boise. We feel like we're not going to get quite the home we want with sixty thousand down. Okay. And you're going to be making what'd you say? So currently making ninety. The promotion expect to make about one forty. Okay. The difference in Eastern Idaho and the white hot Boise real estate market is not fifty percent. And your income is going up 50%. So right. you should be able to move into a the similar home to what you have now in square footage, but it's going to cost more with your increased income with a $60,000 down payment. Now, right, you, right. you can move in with your in-laws if you want. I wouldn't. That'd drive me nuts and them too. Um, but, I mean, you got $60,000 to put down on a house. You're debt-free. You have no payments in the world. Uh, and you live there two or three years, and maybe you move. Okay. Or you rent for a year. Yeah. Rent for a year, and put your sixty thousand in the right, bank. Right. And but I mean, you can move into them if you want. If that just if that's good for you. But um, there, there's very few families in. Uh, I mean, there are, there are in different cultures. Cult, families that come from different cultures do it all the time. But um, you know, I I come from the uh, noble hillbilly culture. And uh, we don't do well moving back home. Right, right. No, that makes sense. So, I mean, it's just there's too much. It, Thanksgiving dinner is a good, that's a good thing. It's a little distance there. We can leave after the turkey's sliced. I don't, but, I mean, some people can do it, and it's okay. I'm not saying, you get, you know, that, that they're bad people or anything like that. I, you're just like a grown guy making 150 grand moving your mother-in-law's basement. It feels weird. Yeah. I, you know, I, I agree with you, but I will say the other side of that coin is if he can do it and he really weighs this thing out, where are we living, what's it look like, how weird is that going to be, can I bite my lip, what kind of relationship does he have, I get it. I'm, I'm in the same boat. But, hey, listen, hey, Stacy's parents are saints, but if you are. moved in with them, they'd kill you. Well, that, that's yeah, you're right. Same as me. That, that mouth, it I'm, wouldn't last. I mean, it works good on talk radio. It doesn't work good at the dinner table. I'm with you, Dave. I'm just trying to go, man, that is nice. If you got that, you can pack a lot of money away. I love my father-in-law. I couldn't live with him 20 minutes. Yeah. Because it, it, it wouldn't be fair to him. I'm not that easy to live with. Yeah. So, I mean, y'all just, you got to decide this stuff. And 
I think sometimes when people ask this question, they're only thinking about math and they haven't thought about the emotional and relational strain they're I walking into. I agree with you on that. Jake's nicer than you and me. It sounds, That's what I it think. It sounds like the math is going to make it all okay. <laughs> The math goes away quick. Not so much. I get it. (laughs) This is The Ramsey Show. personality is my co-host today. Ken is the host of the Ken Coleman Show, which airs on 75 plus radio stations on Sirius XM and is a podcast YouTube show as well. So you can listen to it as a podcast. You can listen to it on YouTube and it's all about discovering your purpose. It is all about you living in the dream, meaning doing work you love and getting paid a lot for doing it. You do not have to take a dumbed down income in order to find work that has meaning. That's a false dichotomy. It's not true. And Ken is here to walk you through that. As a matter of fact, tomorrow, no, not tomorrow night, tonight. Yes. On the stage here at Ramsey, there are big spotlights are out here like it's Hollywood or something. We're getting ready to do this live stream with Ken tonight. And he's going to cover the seven steps to get hired. It's the Get Hired event tonight, the 27th of April. And uh, we want you to tune in tonight. It's... um, Tickets are just $30, and you can text the word HIRED to 33789, and uh, that will come on live at 7 p.m.? 7 p.m. Central, Central, 8 Eastern, yeah. 7 Central, 8 Eastern. So, uh, and tonight you're going to be covering the eight steps and other things as well. Going to be diving really seven deep steps. on the first three stages of get clear, get qualified, get connected. The seven stages to doing what you were born to do. We're going to dive in because those are the three stages that allow you to get noticed and get hired. And uh, I, you know, I actually got something for you, Dave, because the, we'll, we'll unpack the seven stages really quick. We just mentioned the first three because I've got, I want you to weigh in on stage five uh, for our audience. So get clear is figuring out talent, that's what you do best, mm-hmm. passion, work you love to do. And then what are the results? That's the mission that you want to put out in the workplace. Then you got to get qualified. That's stage two. Stage three is get connected, all about relationships. And that's all about your number one best-selling book, The Proximity, the proximity Principle. Principle. The right. right people in the right places give us opportunities. So that puts us at stage four where now we got the gig and we're starting. We, we're on that ladder. Stage five is get promoted. And that's a stage that we stay in for a while as we keep getting promoted, keep climbing the ladder, if you will, until we step into that dream job. And here's the thing that I want you to weigh in on because you have great insight on this. Saw an article yesterday, Dave, that the oldest millennial, okay, in the workplace will turn 40 this year, okay, according to those who determine what's a millennial or not. So the the oldest millennials turn 40. And for the first time, we see that there are just as many people in leadership or management positions under the age of 45, Dave, as there are that are over the age of 45. And so this article is talking about how these millennials are now, as they get promoted, as we see anybody get promoted, at some point you're going to be in leadership. Uh, You hear it as management. We call it leadership here. And so, Dave, it's just inevitable. As I get promoted, I'm going to have opportunities to lead. And they were saying that a lot of these millennials didn't set out to become leaders. We teach a lot about leadership here. You learned to lead. You started out in real estate, started a radio show. As your organization grew, people come in, and you were learning to lead. And thus, you created this term that became a best-selling book, Entree Leadership. Um, I, I thought it would be good for you to kind of explain that. As you're going to get promoted, you're going to have the opportunity to lead people. I think a lot of people are scared. I've never led before. I can't lead. And, and, and I think, and you believe, that leadership can be learned. It can be developed. What do you say to those people who are going, I, I want to get promoted. I want to keep doing it. But I don't know about this leadership thing. Uh, leadership is 
uh, one of the hardest endeavors you'll ever undertake, but it's not complicated. Great statement. So you shouldn't fear it um, because it's not like it, it's like uh, becoming wealthy. There are no secrets to the rich. So like, for instance, when we start some of the lessons in Entree Leadership, one of the lessons I start, I ask people, what are the character qualities of a great leader? And most everyone will tell you about the same thing. Yeah, I've seen you, know, you do it. They all pop they, out they, the they, answers. You know, they use sometimes they use a little bit of a different word, but there's only about five or six things that pop up every time. They're a servant. They're humble. They have integrity. They have vision. They have energy and passion. Um, they're affirming. Uh, the things like that are what we always hear. That's what you think of when you think of a leader. Now, not necessarily a boss. If you want to be a boss, that's a different thing. But if you want to be a leader, you've got to be in front. You can't be behind. Bosses are behind with the whip, driving cattle. Yes. Leaders are out front casting a vision and saying, this is where we're going. If you want to go, the train is leaving in just a moment. Hear the whistle? You need to be on the print train. This is where we're going. And if you don't get on the train, you're going to be left at the station. And so leaders sometimes leave people behind that don't want to go, won't keep up. Uh, sometimes we ask people off the bus, as my friend Jim Collins says, uh, because they shouldn't have been on there. They don't fit in with the vision. They don't, they're, they're a toxic uh, you know, problem inside the organization. They don't have the skills to bring it. Uh, whatever. And so we have to walk with them. But if you will just love people and serve them and not try to be a boss and think about, okay, if I'm going to lead, name the person doing that job, just switch roles for a second, treat other people like you'd want to be treated. So how would you want someone to do that? You'd want them to occasionally smile. You want them to say, Hey, that was, you did a good job Mm -hmm. at that. That was good a good job you'd want to be told when you're doing something doofus so you don't do it again because you don't want to be a perpetual doofus that's not good for anybody uh you know what would you want people to do if you were being led and that it's really not complicated but it's hard because people some people are crazy (laughs) yeah the best thing about leadership is people yeah about the worst is people exactly about two percent of the public should be institutionalized so um you know and some of them will come to work for you god help you you know and, and, and they, 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 they dress up nice, so you make the mistake of hiring them. But then they get in the building, and you got problems. And then you get other people who surprise you the other way that you thought, well, I don't know if that's going to amount to much, but it turns out to be dadgum Albert Einstein, mm-hmm. you know. And um, actually, that was Churchill's um, grade school teacher sent home a note to his mother that said, this one's not going to amount to much. Winston freaking Churchill, you know, and so, you know, but sometimes you have that, you get the surprise, right? Obviously that grade school teacher was a bit surprised if he lived long enough. Um, but the, um, uh, to see the man that almost single-handedly saved the free world, oh. you know, in a, in an unbelievable, uh, act of leadership. Yeah. Uh, and, and so a series of acts of leadership, but again, it's not, it's not really complicated. It's just hard because you are subordinating uh, your own rights. You're putting other people forward and you're putting the mission ahead of your own rights. It's not the leader who wants to be in charge in order to be in charge is never going to make it. No, no. The leader who wants to be in charge because if we got, get, all get this done together, we're going to get it done right. And we're going to yes. get it done faster. And a bunch of people are going to be helped on the other side. Mission critical, mission first, yeah. driven by the task, driven by the desired future. And we're all on the page to that. And anybody that's not on page to that, we're going to help you get on the page or get you somewhere else. Yep. That's leading. Yep. Jim Collins, our friend that you mentioned earlier, he calls that a level five leader based on the research. And basically his one sentence description of those level five leaders is, is that it, if we win, we all win. Like, so if you win, we win. If we win in this team, the whole company wins. So if this particular division wins here, the whole company wins. If the customer wins, we win. It is, as you said, mission above everything else. And that's really huge. And Dave, to what you said about it not being complex, the research shows that men and women would rather get public recognition or some type of reward, reward or recognition more than a raise. And that the, speaks to what you're talking about. And they don't care if the leader's perfect. No. All they care is is that they're that that they are that they're just telling the truth. Yes. 
Do they care about me? Yeah, do they care about me and, and telling the truth? You know, no. like going through COVID, you know, I told everybody, we run out of money, we're all going home. Because I'm not borrowing money to prop up payroll. Mm -hmm. I told everybody that. Yeah. And let me tell you what happens. Here's what how much cash we got, and here's where we're going to be. And when the cash runs out, uh, leadership's all going to go to zero pay. Yeah. And when that doesn't work, then some of you are going to zero pay. And when that doesn't work, we're a bunch of us going to zero pay forever. And so uh, if this thing persists, and so they, people stayed, nobody took a pay cut. Nobody got furloughed. Nobody got laid off as a result of COVID. But we did not know that at the time, and they appreciated just being told the truth and treated like adults. That's exactly what happened. And other companies told them nothing. Told their employees nothing. Nothing. Yeah. That's not leadership. That's doofuses. This is The Ramsey Show. Have a friend or family member that needs a daily dose of Ramsey advice in their life? Let them know about the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast. It's a quick hit of advice about life and money in under 10 minutes. Check out the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality and host of The Ken Coleman Show is my co-host today. The Ken Coleman Show talks all about finding your purpose, all about your career, getting a job, the income side of the income outgo equation that I deal with every day. And Ken's here to help you with that, as well as we will talk about your life and your money, whatever's going on. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Alexandria is starting this hour in Atlanta. Hi, Alexandria. How are you? Hey, Dave. Hey, Ken. How's it going? Great. What's up? Um, so I'm a 30-year-old nurse practitioner here in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Um, I spoke with you actually last year in March, um, and I followed your plan. I was able to eliminate $260,000 in eight months in debt. Whoa. Oh, wait a minute. Whole full stop. <laughs> way to go. And so you, like, took COVID nursing and made it like a thing, huh? Absolutely. Ding, ding. What did you make in that in this last year? Um, whew, I owed fifteen grand in taxes, so probably I almost hit almost five hundred k last year. Whoa! So how many hours yeah. a week were you working? Um, so I worked seven days a week. I worked three different jobs. When COVID hit, I went over to New York and Texas, and I was making ten grand a week, up to thirteen grand a week doing that. And I just became intentional because student loans were debt, um, not debt free, but they were interest free. And I was just making sure I was knocking it out. I made a challenge to my family that I would eliminate those student loans by the end of December. And on December 31st, I went live on my social media showing everyone that I had paid off my student loans. <laughs> freaking superwoman. Yes. Wonder Woman something. I don't know. That's amazing. I mean, <laughs> you didn't you. run hide from COVID. You went running into the fire. And yeah, and, you told and, me I was being wimpy last year, so uh -oh. I had a point to prove. <laughs> oh, I called you out, and you went and did that? I'm, did. I'm loving my advice right now. That's so cool. Coach, put me in the game. I like it. Wow, you are amazing, girl. I'm so proud of you. Congratulations. You. And How's Alexandria, you're you not have to wimpy. Feel, you have to feel, one lady said the other day, she said she felt accomplished. You have to feel accomplished. Oh, I feel very accomplished. I sat down with my financial advisor yesterday, and he said, wow, you're you're really prepared. And I was like, you know, I followed the Dave Ramsey plan, and thank you. I feel really good for you to say that to me. That's very nice. Well, I'm so proud of you. Okay. So uh, now on to the next steps, huh? Correct. So I have a six-month fully funded emergency fund. Um, I maxed out on my 401k contributions. I maxed out at the 15%. So what I did was I created an additional IRA for after-tax contributions. Um, but now I still have a, a good amount of money left over from my salary monthly. And I just wanted to know what are some additional ways 
um, that I could invest. Um, I wanted to become invested in real estate, but I wanted to do it by cash flowing. I don't want to go back into debt. So I wanted to know what are some other ways that I could use my money to work for me um, until I can actually fully fund and cash flow real estate. Wow. That's amazing. So your home is paid off now? So I sold my home, um, and I used some of that money to fund my emergency account because I took a job in Chicago. So I'm back and forth between Atlanta and Chicago. Um, So I don't know if I want to buy a home yet because I won't be in there for five years, so it wouldn't make sense for me to buy a house, and I'm not there for five years. Um, So that kind of leaves me where I am now, and I've already saved up a down payment. How many hours are you working now? I'm 40 hours a week. Okay. All right. Wow. Well, I'm glad you're uh, back to a reasonable rhythm now that you had that year of craziness. Wow. I so, am. Yeah. So here's what I do. I'm trying to figure out how to apply it to your situation. When I max out everything, of course, I'm in baby step seven, which you are right now because you don't own a home. So, um, uh, you know, max out all retirement that's available, which is what you've done. And then I drop money into just an S&P 500 fund, an index fund. Okay. Um, low to no commissions and very stable. It's going to do exactly what the market does. It is the standard Poor 500 Dow Jones industrial average. These are the measures of what the stock market's doing. And so it's going to follow the market. And that's what I do. I park it there until there's enough in that account to buy the piece of real estate that I'm wanting to buy. Okay. And I pay cash for it out of that. And so Perfect. it's going to it's gonna be more volatile, obviously, than a, uh, a CD or something like that, but it's also going to make about 10 times more. If it sits in there a year or more, too, the increases in value are taxed at the capital gains rate, which in your case is 15%, um, and instead of your ordinary income rate, which is probably 35 And so you get less taxes on it if it sits in there a year on the growth portion. And... Um, you don't have any taxes on it hardly because it's got a low, low turnover ratio until you pull it out. And so if it sits there three or four years, it's not going to create taxes for you. And um, so I, I, would, I would tell you not to start buying real estate until you've decided which city, just like you don't want to buy a house until you decide which city. So let's, let's figure that out. So if this is just a good place to park a pile of money to buy your next house with cash and then maybe buy your first rental or two once you've decided which city you're going to settle into, but you are a beast, girl. You're amazing. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. Again, just, you know, she takes that, that statement that she made to her parents, you know, her family, and she hit it. I mean, that is, there's gazelle intense and that's like super gazelle. Yeah. Well, I mean, I call her, I call her wimpy and she's like, I'm going to show you, old man. Which I love a good, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right. She put the old chip on her shoulder, right? Yeah. Wimpy this. Yeah. It's the truth. It's like Tom Brady, you know, six round, six round draft pick. He's like, I'll show all you teams. Yeah. I mean, that is awesome. And uh, a she's commitment. amazing. Whew. That, what a great story. Seven days a week, three jobs. That encourages me to call more people wimpy, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Who among us doesn't need a nice little chip, right? <laughs> Some people don't like the chip on the shoulder. I, I think a lot of great men and women have done things with chips oh, on their man. shoulder. That I mean, $500,000 as a nurse. Yeah. In nurse one year. Yeah. yeah. Oh, unbelievable. Three jobs. I mean, she went to text. She went where the work she was. ran into the fire. That's what I like. She, she said, went right. where the money was, the work was, Come and worked on. like crazy. Wow. Yeah. Extraordinary story. That's uh, And paid off $200,000 worth of debt. So, I, and, and, you know, isn't it interesting how we both live, someone listening to this who uh, was a nurse and never left their home for 12, 14 months, and their home's getting foreclosed on because they lost their job at the hospital, because they're not doing any elective surgeries. Same exact industry, same exact economy, same exact pandemic, and one goes and makes a half million dollars, another one loses their home. It's just, that's just, human nature is amazing. It really is. You know, we, you and Rachel Cruz and I, we did this big event, uh, Message of Hope, and the big message from all three of us was control the controllables. Let me tell you something. Alexandria said, I can control this. <laughs> she went after it. Man. Wow. So impressive. This is The Ramsey Show.
What makes our show unique is that we genuinely care about our listeners. We're intentional about choosing the best advertisers to recommend. Blinds.com is no exception. They offer high quality window treatments at unbelievable prices and they make it simple to shop blinds, shades, and interior shutters with easy online ordering, free shipping, and a guaranteed perfect fit. Go to blinds.com and take advantage of this week's special savings. Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host. I can't get over that last caller making a half million dollars as a nurse during COVID. Yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm all I can think of is that somebody will some people will always find a way to succeed and some people will always find a way to fail. You know, I mean, <laughs> people are going to look back. Can you imagine like 30 years from now, okay? You look back on 911. Mm. Okay? Or you look back on you know, when when your grandparents look back on Pearl Harbor, or we look back on 2020 with the pandemic, and you say, and and Grandma's sitting there, and she goes, "Best year of my life." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's it's extraordinary because you hear somebody make excuses about how the pandemic ruined their life from lack of opportunity. Okay, and then you hear Alexandria's story, and you go, "Huh? Uh-huh. Why don't you talk to her?" Yeah, talk to the guy in the plexiglass business. He did well. Oh, good All right. boy. Nicole's with us in Augusta, Maine. Hey, Nicole, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Um, so me and my husband are on baby step three, I believe. So we're debt free besides the house and we're working towards our emergency fund. We have eight thousand in place right now. Great. And after that, Thank you. And after that, we want to buy a car. Good. And he brought a situation to me, and I've heard you talk about it on the show, to stay away from it. So kind of just wanted you to help me walk through the situation. He said that we would like to save up to lease a car. So instead of paying monthly, you can just put it all down in the beginning for the three years. Mm -hmm. Um, So he was looking at a 2021 Ram um, with 380 a month. So that would be like $13,000, paying that up front. And then the buyout would be twenty three hundred or 23000 mm-hmm. And in that three years of having it, saving up that 23000 to pay it off. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just wasn't sure how to go about that. I've heard you talk about leasing cars as the most expensive way to drive a car. It is. So I just wanted your advice. <laughs> it is. And the most expensive car ever is a brand new one. The worst car accidents happen on the showroom floor. So when he drives that beautiful, fabulous pickup off the showroom floor, he's going to lose $10,000 that day. That's what I was um, thinking because his argument was His argument is he wants a truck, and he's (laughs) he's willing to overlook any amount of mathematics in order to buy a truck. He thinks that he'll be actually getting it for less because it'd be $23,000. Well, that's because he's not good at math. And... um, and so I let me help you with this. If you take $13,000 over to Hertz and prepay your rental payment, they'll let you drive a Hertz car for a long time, too. Okay. And if you add up $13,000 and $24,000 and you figure out what you're actually paying for this Dodge Ram when it's all said and done, it is more than you would have paid for it had you walked in there and laid Benjamins on the table. Because it wouldn't be till three years later that it would be I know. completely paid off. So I know. It would, it Listen, would let me easy. ask you something. Do you really think that Chrysler is stupid? No, and that's why I was yeah. calling you because I was, I was yeah. like, this. there's got to be Your a husband has not is... found the one time that Chrysler made a mistake. 
Right. Like, they've got to be making money on this somehow. Yeah, I it's think. It's not like he found a loophole. So yeah, he didn't I, find I, a loophole. When you add it up, the actual cost on a lease averages 14% cost of capital. It's like borrowing money at 14% interest. And the value of this car. Plus, this car is going to go down in value rapidly because he's buying a brand new car and you all aren't millionaires. No, we're not. So you should not be buying a brand new car and, and taking that kind of a hit and loss in value until you're millionaires. You can't afford to lose okay. this much. So boy's got okay. boy's got truck fever. He needs cold showers what he needs. Yeah, and um so my other question when we do go to buy a car, I know you say don't, you know, spend it on or buy it that's more than fifty percent of your All your cars added together. Oh, all your all your cars added together. Okay, that's good to know. I didn't know that. And would it be annual income of both of us? Yeah, the, your household income. Okay. What's your What's your household income? The two of you added together. Well, right now I'm going to full time school, so my income is very like hit or miss, and yeah. um, his is seventy thousand, okay. and he is getting a pay raise in September, but only like five hundred dollars a month. Okay, so he makes seventy six thousand dollars, and what what are you know? So you don't want the, all of your cars to be worth more than about thirty five, forty thousand bucks. And the okay. only the only reason is is that I love cars, and I don't. I'm not against you having a decent car. I'm against the car owning you. Mm-hmm. If you got eighty thousand dollars worth of cars and you make eighty thousand dollars a year, you have so much tied up in things that are going backward that you can't build wealth. Definitely, yeah. I was definitely hesitant on the situation, but didn't really know how to work it out to make you know to kind of say, okay, this is a bad idea. Um, oh, it's definitely so a bad you. idea. So you start with the premise that Chrysler's not stupid and they're not going to lose money. If you haven't figured out how they're making money, that doesn't mean they're not. It just means you haven't figured it out. Mm-hmm. That's all it means. Because listen, if you turn that car back in. That car has to sell for more than 24000 at the time you turn it back mm-hmm. in, or they're going to lose money. They don't lose money. Yeah. They've got thousands and thousands of Dodge Rams on the road, and they have lots of statistical evidence of exactly what that puppy's going to be worth at the end of this lease. A closed-end lease, mm-hmm. the residual value, the buyout at the end of the lease is, is a statistical analysis. It's an actuarial table. These guys do not screw these things up. If they do, they lose millions and millions and millions of dollars because it didn't just happen on your car. It happened on all of them like your car. Yes. So is the buyout base, like, calculated to what they estimate it to be in the three years? No, the buyout is what they they estimate it to be uh, more, slightly more than the car is worth. Oh, okay. At the time. At at that time. They're estimating okay. if you got a twenty-four thousand dollars buyout at the end of the lease, they're estimating that car is going to be worth somewhat less than twenty-four thousand dollars. Okay, yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking. Yeah. Um, I think another person's argument in the situation that we we're talking about was that somebody just bought like a two thousand eighteen like Chevy for thirty-five, forty thousand dollars in two thousand fifteen. So they were like, trucks really hold their value. Oh, bull but- crap. <laughs> You are you are listening I, to a I, whole lot of broke people with truck fever. Uh, listen, I drove a Raptor. I didn't drive it today. I got a Raptor in the garage. I drove it yesterday. I I like big trucks. I I like you know. I don't own a single car with a horsepower less than four hundred horsepower. So um, I like cars. I like stuff that goes with zoom zoom. But they all go down in value. That you're getting screwed on all of them financially when you buy them. They're all they all suck. This idea that, you know, they hold their value. Yeah, you know, just visit one that's three or four years old and then laugh about that stupid butt statement. That's just ridiculous. Hold their value by their fingernails for 20 seconds, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, people, I've heard this before. I've heard people hit you with these scenarios before. And it's like they think they've got it figured out. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I actually, when I first got on the radio, there's a guy, there's a Christian guy in another part of town that called up and he was all offended because he owned one of the car dealerships. Mm-hmm. And I was telling people leasing cars rip off and they're ripping people off. And he goes, well, I'm a Christian. I'm not ripping people off. And I go, yeah, you are. And he wanted to, he wanted to come and sit down and talk to me. <laughs> and after two hours of going through the math with him, I said, show me one time where you're not making more money leasing the car than you are selling the car. Show me one time and I'll shut up. And he couldn't find a single one. Well, as Christians, we ought to agree. And I'm like, well, Christians ought to be able to do math, Bubba. 
<laughs> you know, there this is, is a that. thing. You know, it's yeah. not it's not a Christian thing. I mean, Jesus doesn't hate you for leasing right. a car. That's not the point. Um, I mean, I mean, he probably it, yeah, well, yeah, bad bad dad jokes are running through my mind about being all in one accord. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, you just it's but yeah, it's just dumb. It's just dumb. Don't do it. You know, listen. If, if you look around and you don't see millionaires doing it, then that gives you a hint. And if broke people are giving you all your advice about trucks holding their value, then that's another hint. Chrysler's not losing money. That's another hint. Lots of hints here. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey folks, I got a great option to help you pay for your education. The Army National Guard. The Army National Guard believes you are the next greatest generation because you have proven that even in adversity, that you have what it takes to succeed. That's why they offer benefits like tuition assistance, career training, and a paycheck to help you avoid debt. No matter what your goals are, the Army National Guard can help you get there. Visit nationalguard.com to find out more. Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage. Chris and Jeanette are with us. Hey, guys. Hey, Hi. Dave. How are you? Better than I deserve. Awesome. Welcome to Nashville. Thank Love you. the T-shirts. <laughs> Be weird. <laughs> De- hashtag debt-free. <laughs> like it. How much do you guys pay off? We paid off $21,300. Love it. How long yeah. did this take? About nine months. Good for you. And your range of income during that time? Uh, about 62000 Good for you. What do y'all do for a living? I'm in retail management, mm-hmm. and my wife stays at home with the boys, and she works at our local church. In children's uh, children's ministry. Awesome. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Good for you guys. What kind of debt was the 21000 Everything but student loans, I think, basically. <laughs> uh, 401k loan, credit cards, personal Young and loan. D- dumb yep. spending. Yep. <laughs> so you kind of had, a, you're like normal. Yeah. You kind of been bopping along, look up. Nine, yeah. How long y'all been married? 18 years. 18 years. Yeah. No. Right. Yeah. Just go with it. 18 years. <laughs> <laughs> I've never have, seen that before. They both have it dialed in. I'm yeah. telling you. Well, we've been <laughs> we've been together since high school, so okay. we've been together for yeah. a while. Yeah. Good for you. Okay. So what in the world happened nine months ago that made you decide we're getting out of debt? Oh, gosh. So we have, we have to go back a little bit. So about 12 years ago, um, we were uh, young and dumb. Uh-huh. And we went to go see a bankruptcy attorney because we were ten thousand dollars in debt. Uh-huh. And the bankruptcy attorney looked at us and said, "You guys are not broke." Wow. She's like, um, "I'm going to give you a gift," and she gave us your book. Yep. Wow! Yes, she yes. gave us your book. What an unusual bankruptcy right? attorney! Isn't that crazy? Most of them will file bankruptcy on six hundred dollars, man. And yeah. she didn't even cash the check that we that paid. we paid her. <laughs> wow! She just, yeah. So um, I wish I could tell you that we were like, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna do that," and but we did. You took the book home, we took used the book it as home. a coaster yeah. on the coffee table. Yeah, and then um, uh, last, well, t- early 2020, um, you came actually, you came out to our church, Real Life, in, in Claremont, oh, yeah. Florida. Okay. And, and and you were there, and that right after that, we were like, that's it, we're done, we're going to do this, so... Yeah. So well, it was we worth are. the trip. It was definitely worth the trip. I got, I got yes. one. <laughs> it was worth the trip. <laughs> Absolutely. That's awesomeness. Now, real life's a great, that's a great place. Yes. 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 You that's got many. Folks. Yes. That's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful people. And so you come home from that and you're going, okay, God just got in our face. Mm-hmm. We got to do this. Dave yes. just talked at the church. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And, and we were like, all right, we're going to do it. Where's that stupid book? <laughs> <laughs> let's get the dust off of that thing and let's get going. <laughs> we actually did the FPU. Yeah. So we did FPU right right, right, right. after that. And um, yeah, just hit the ground running. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Congratulations. You're so good. How yes. much did the community, when you got into FPU, because you had heard the message 
from Dave, you're, and he gives it, right? Yes. Like no one can give it. You yeah. got it. Yes. Then you jump in. How did that community of accountability really strengthen you guys or maybe fire you up even more? What did it do for you? It. I mean, it did. It totally did. I felt like I was kind of always there. It was him. So I thank you, Dave. You got to him for <laughs> sure. Mm. He has listened hours and hours of just your podcasts and just – read your book and just he's really dived deep in and so wow yep i think yeah you. <laughs> and we almost didn't make it to the uh to to your um to, to your presentation at, mm -hmm. at church my wife was like no let's go and i was just kind of she so she kind of dragged me in and man I, I think sometimes if i had never gone you know we might be even more in debt so wow. yeah it was just awesome it was awesome wow so yeah you know i i um Wow, that's amazing. I'm just so proud of you guys. Yeah, it fired us up. Yeah. Well, well <laughs> I even done. got a second job and everything. So. <laughs> yeah, I just got an email from your pastor like two weeks ago. Oh, really? Just nice. checking in. Yeah, he's nice. such a great guy. He yes. is. He's awesome. He's awesome. Yeah. He's awesome. So, well done, you guys. So fun. Okay, yes. now you've been through Financial Peace University. Yes. You paid off $21,000 in debt. Yes. You're living on less than you make, something Congress can't do. <laughs> and um, what do you tell people the secret to getting out of debt is? You're professionals. You've done it. Yeah. Um, you said something that really resonated with me when you came down, and you just uh, you said God gives us the dignity to choose, and you said just decide that you're going to do it, and that just stuck with me. So when we got back home, we were like, all right, we can keep doing what we're doing, or we can try something new, and um, we just decided, and we were on the same page. Um, I would say pract like, the practical things for us was getting on a budget. Mm -hmm. We had done budgets before. We just never stuck to them. Mm -hmm. And so now every month we have a budget meeting before the month starts. Yep. And we sit down and, you know, we, we look at the, the, you know, the monthly expenses. And, you know, the first couple months it was a flop because we were, <laughs> you know, but it got easier and easier. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Yeah, you're yeah. not pros at it the first little while. Yeah, yeah exactly. It takes a little while to get it dialed in. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Good for you. But it Good can be done. <laughs> what, was the, what was the toughest part for y'all? Hmm. I got one. The toughest part for me was um, the uh, Saturday nights. We we uh, started oh Uber my second job, Ubering, yeah. Uber uh, delivering food. Yeah, right? during As COVID, my hours got cut in half, mm. and I was like, "Oh no, this we got to figure help. something out." Yeah. So I started Ubering, um, food delivery, mm -hmm. and so we just. Yeah, the hardest part was uh, okay. driving around on a Saturday night and watching everyone have dinner and we're picking up deliveries. And, and we kind of, I was like, man, I would love to just pull over and go grab a bite to eat. But uh, we stayed focused, you know, and we made our car trip into a date night where yes. we kind of mm -hmm. just, you know, we packed the car with some snacks and we hit the road and, you know, that was but like, like you, were, you were like delivering temptation to every door. I mean, it, was <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is. <laughs> oh, that's harsh. It's like yeah. delivering pizzas when you can't have any, you know, it's, oh my gosh, it's horrible. At what point in the nine months was this moment that you just described? This was like really early on. This was um, probably March, like during, like right when COVID right in hit. Right COVID. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, March or... Yeah. Quar quarantine city, yeah. yeah. Was there a point in the nine months where you finally experienced momentum? You went, okay, I feel like now... Oh, yeah. We yeah. Okay, what was it? Yeah, uh, for me, it was probably like... Um, like in the, I think when we hit the halfway mark, we were like, okay, we can do this. Yeah. And so yeah. we started sacrificing. you start seeing those numbers just yeah. keep going down. Yeah. I sold one of my cars, Dave. Oh! <laughs> I was like, we got to get... We're, I said, we, could, we can go another couple months or I could just sell the car today and we'll be done. And so wow. that's what I did. Yeah. Yes. Knocked so, it out. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And Absolutely. now save up and get another one. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you brought the kiddos with you. What are their yes. names and ages? Bring them into the yes. shop. Yes. Jacob and Jaden. Jaden is here, four years old. Mm -hmm. and Jacob is my big guy. He's 10. ten. All right. Very cool. Now, who were your biggest cheerleaders? Um, gosh, our church family was awesome. Uh, our mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, she's right off camera. She did wonderful things. She babysat the kids while we went out, and, mm -hmm. and she was uh, she, just cheering us on every single step of the way. So. Yeah, that's huge yes. to have family in there with you and Absolutely. your church family. Yes. Your church family as well. Yes. Well done. All right. 
Chris and Jeanette, Jacob and Jaden from Orlando, Florida, $21,000 paid off in nine months, making 62 a year. We got a copy of the Legacy Journey for you, which is the next step in your journey as you move forward. I'm also going to give you an extra copy of Total Money Makeover so you can pay it forward and give it to somebody else and give them that book that 12 years later they will read. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> so perfect. Count it down, guys. Let's hear a debt-free scream. All right. All right. Three, Three, two, two one. one. We're, We're debt free! You know, you and I log a lot of airline miles, or we did before, uh, yes. and we will again Yes. Uh, every year, going to a lot of places and speaking to a lot of people, and um, I speak to usually, uh, in a typical year, uh, not last year, but a typical year, 10 to 12 churches, uh, as they're launching a church-wide Financial Peace University initiative, and uh, that's what was happening there in Orlando when I went down. And, you know, I don't always get to hear. That, no. that it was worth the trip. Yes. But that that made it worth the trip. Always does. That's why everybody longs to work. And that's our work here at Ramsey Solutions is to give practical hope to people that you can get where you want to go. And that right there, that's that's real legacy. Uh, I love the book, The Legacy Journey's going to them because now they can create a legacy that they couldn't have before because of financial freedom, because of financial peace. This is The Ramsey Show. personality is my co-host today our question of the day comes from blinds.com they have a 100 percent satisfaction guarantee means even if you mismeasure or you pick the wrong color they'll remake your window blinds for free free samples free shipping and the new promos they run all the time you save even more use the promo code ramsey it's magic it'll get you the best deal today's question comes from karen in alabama she asked my employer is secretly interviewing for my position to hire someone else in at a lower salary. Should I stay until I get let go or start looking for a new job now? Karen, start looking now. If this, I mean, we have to assume this is true. This is not good. This is horrible leadership. I, I, I'm not laughing because I feel it, this is so bad that, that an employer would do this. And uh, 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 I don't know. You and they're not even good at it. <laughs> no. Because <laughs> no. she found out. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's time to you look elsewhere. You need to look elsewhere. at your employer and say, you're fired. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. How about I fire you? Yes, I'm going to secretly leaving. leave right now. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, you need to go get a job yesterday, kiddo. Goodness gracious. Get out of that place as fast as you can. Run, don't walk. Oh. Heather is with us. Heather is in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hey, Heather, what's up? Hey, oh my gosh. Thank you, gentlemen, for taking my call. It's such an honor to speak to both of you today. You too. How can we help? Awesome. Um, so, um, I have actually, instead of gone backwards in pay, I was able to double my income in this past year. Wow. Um, yeah, and finally, you know, make the six figure mark, which I had <laughs> a lifelong goal of hitting before I hit 35 and finally hit that at 36, but Good hey, I'll for you. It. Yeah. Um, what do you do? Thank you so much. Um, I am a medical scientist for clinical research. Good so I look for at you. clinical trial data. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, but with that <laughs> comes some challenges that I'm trying to face, and I'm hoping to get some advice. Um, so I'm uh, married. We've been married for about nine years. We have two small kids. 
And uh, my husband still wants to keep everything separate. And I'm trying to get us, you know, out of debt. Um, I currently have a nice, you know, student loan chunk of $92,000 and some personal stuff that I'm trying to get rid of. Um, But he just doesn't want to get on board and instead wants to keep it separate. So I have absolutely no idea what's going on on his end of things. So I'm wondering, can I do this um, baby step number two by myself now that I have my bigger shovel? Or, you know, how can I get my husband on board? Because now that I make essentially double what he does, he's having a hard time with it. So I don't know how to handle it. (laughs) Why am I not shocked? Um, What does he do for a living? Um, He's military. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, What does he do in the military? Um, He is... um, He's active duty, so, yeah. Yeah, he's active duty in the Army. Okay. All right. Uh, just infantry, is that yeah. what you're saying, or he doesn't have a specialty inside the military? Uh, no, he's uh, special forces. Oh, okay. All right, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so he does a lot of stressful, high-intense stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. This is a marriage problem. This is a marriage problem. It's a marriage problem. It's not a financial <laughs> problem. And um, uh, and uh, the chances of this guy that you described to me going to a marriage counselor is probably fairly low. Um, but that's what you guys need. You need someone to help you navigate. Uh, your pastor at your church could serve the purpose if he's he or she's got some counseling chops, um, but to sit down with someone to help you guys navigate through all the different variables that are happening in your relationship, you making more, his uh, incredible, intense job, uh, what it is that's causing him to want to keep the money separate. Why does it need to be separate? What's he afraid of? Uh, So I've made some, you know, bad money decisions, which racked up some debt, but I'm working through that. You know, I just paid off my car two years early uh, this weekend. How long ago did you make bad money decisions? (laughs) Um, So uh, let's see. I guess since we've been kind of been dating, I'm a big impulse spender. I mean, how long ago was your last bad money decision? Um, Over a year. Over a year ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so maybe part of you all combining this is for you to be accountable. Yeah. Which I'm totally fine with. You know, that's kind mm-hmm. of why I want him on board. I'm like, I want to be held accountable. I want mm-hmm. him to say, hey, do you really need that trip to Target? You know, $200 mm-hmm. toothpaste. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we have a budget that we have yeah. agreed to before our month begins, and it would include Target only to a certain amount. And anything past mm-hmm. that, you would be breaking your contract with him. Yeah, which I'm fine doing. Yeah. Yeah. Is he very conservative with his money? Does he have any debt? Uh, He does have some debt. Uh, He just bought a new truck last year, um, and I know he's got a credit card, uh, but he's been a lot better with money. He had a bunch better uh, money school than I did growing up. Um, But, I mean, other than those two things that I know about, I don't know about the other stuff. I don't know. You know, I see stuff come in. and Let me tell you. Here's the data. The data points are this, okay? Um, The guys and gals that do what he does, uh, they face death in the eye uh, fairly regularly. And so they have a tendency to detach. It's It's a normal defense mechanism. Um, and, uh, it's very, very tough to be the spouse uh, of special forces, um, uh, until they really get their arms around, uh, all the emotions that they feel and plug those into your relationship. It's a very tough thing. We do a lot of work with special forces. I, I think these are some of the best people on the planet. They're incredible, but they do things and see things that none of the rest of us can do or ever see. And so it, it just is a different world. And, um, but that doesn't change the data. The data tells us that couples who do not work together on money have a higher uh, problem rate in their marriage and a higher divorce rate and have a lower chance of actually building wealth. 
the do it separately and be roommates thing almost never works relationally or financially. And so he's barking up the wrong tree. It's not going to work. It's bad tactics oh, for yeah. the mission would be the phrase I would use to him. Okay. The tactics that he has laid out for this particular mission suck. The mission's going to fail. And the mission is life and marriage and wealth building. And the tactic that he's mm -hmm. using uh, is a uh, defense mechanism. It is not a, it's not an offensive proper tactic. That's how I would talk to him. And you can play this back for him if you want to. I don't care. Because I love the guy. Yeah. I, love, I love what he does. I love, what the, I love that I'm free because of men like him. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so am I. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm. You know, I appreciate him, but I don't appreciate the way he's treating his wife. And I, uh, and you got it. Your your part in this is you're going to have to stop the stupid stuff, and you're going to have to step into the accountability and use your newfound income and if you can get him to the table, your newfound cooperation to really make some serious strides forward. So, we're going to help. We're going to salute you in your new uh, promotion. And we're going to salute him uh, because we appreciate what he does for this country. And we're going to give you Ramsey Plus for a year, which puts the two of you into uh, Financial Peace University together, Every Dollar Budgeting app together. And uh, if you guys will watch those videos together and start, I think it will cause him to come to the table possibly and start doing these things together. I'm challenging him to do that. Um, you know, I need him to man up here. As, 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 and, and walk with his wife, not just throw her in the ditch and hope she makes it. You know, you did something stupid like for a while, and I don't trust you, so you just wallow over there in the ditch by yourself. Good luck with that. You know, that's just not, that's not manning up. And so, um, you know, walk with your wife, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Unto thee, all my worldly goods I pledge. Those are the old fashioned marriage vows. Hold on, Kelly's going to pick up. We're going to get you signed up to go through Ramsey Plus together. But I also recommend you sit down and see a marriage counselor while you're doing that, too. This is The Ramsey Show. This is James Childs, producer of The Ramsey Show. You can listen to all our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. Browse by topic or even sync clips to your friends. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today. This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Ken Coleman, host of The Ken Coleman Show, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225, that's 888-825. 825-5225. Listen, tonight is the Get Hired event, Tuesday, the 27th of April. Ken Coleman will be doing a live stream event teaching you the seven-step path to your dream job. The seven things you need to do to get to your dream job job get hired this economy is heating back up after covid the competition is picking up for the jobs and people are stepping out and it's time to get into a position of something that you love and ken can help you do that it's only thirty dollars for the live stream text the word hired to three three seven eight nine it starts in a matter of about four hours from right now seven central eight Eastern. Text HIRED 
to 33789. Get you a $30 ticket and get hired. It's going to be awesome. going to be a lot of fun, Dave. Live crowd in our gorgeous lobby here at Ramsey Solutions World Headquarters. And, of course, people tuning in wherever they have a device and a uh, internet signal. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to give you the edge to win tonight. Don't forget, uh, you're trying to convince employers that you can help them win. And if they're looking at multiple people, it is a competition. I don't care if you want to look at it that way or not. That's the fact. We're going to teach you how to win. Yeah. And there, there are some things you do to get hired. That's exactly right. There's a strategy involved. There's These are practical good. steps. This isn't mindset. This is, I've got to do this so that I get the opportunity to be interviewed. And when I get interviewed, how do I win that interview? And this is for those of you that have realized that yeah. filling out one application <laughs> among 10,000 people is not working for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the days of going on LinkedIn and firing 50 resumes and sitting back and waiting for the waiting for the results are long since over. You're now getting AI, artificial intelligence, is looking at keywords in your resume most of the time. You're not even getting a human to look at it initially. That's if you're lucky. If you're lucky, you're right. You may just get buried in a pile. <laughs> we'll have about 30,000 applications come in this year for 300 wow. jobs. Wow. We're going to hire 300 people this year, and we'll have about 30,000 applications. We don't have AI. That's true. And that simply means you are going to be stuck in the pile. If you don't do something to get your resume out of that stinking pile. Yeah. And Ken can show you how to do that for Ramsey. He can show you how to do that for a lot of people. And uh, and so, uh, you know, there, there is a series of common sense steps here that he's going to walk you through. So text uh, text hi uh, hired to 33789. Text hired to 33789. Emma is with us in Dallas to start off this hour. Hey, Emma, how are you? Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. I'm great. How are you? Better than I deserve. How can we help? Um, my husband and I are currently on baby step number two. Uh, we need to buy a second car, though, so that way I can go back to work in office. I have been working from home since COVID, and they're now wanting us to go back. Mm -hmm. So we need to get a second car. Okay. We have $10,000 in savings right now. So my question is, should we put our saving towards our debt or buying a used car? Oh, so you're not really in baby step two. You're working your own plan. Well, I'm trying to be in baby step two. I'm just trying to figure well, what is, out what baby to step do about one the is what? Car. What is baby step one? Saving a thousand dollars. And everything above that goes on your debt. Right. So you didn't do that. Well, we just got married, so the ten thousand dollars came from. Um, when when our did you get married? Yet. In February. Okay. Yeah, and this is April. Right. We're just so you got to decide. You got to have to decide what you're going to do here. Okay. So what would I do? I'd go buy a two thousand dollar car. I would put uh, seven thousand dollars on my debt, and I have a thousand dollars in the account. And I would do that by Friday. Okay. Are you going to do that? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I just want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing about the used car. I don't want to um, buy something brand new either. And I also have a twenty. Well, you can't buy anything brand new for two thousand dollars. I'm sorry? You can't buy anything brand new for $2,000. You don't have that problem. Oh, I know. I know. I'm saying that I have a car loan that has $23,000 on it, so I'm wondering if I should trade in my car also at the same time. Oh, you. Okay. Well, that's a different part of the question that I didn't know anything about until just now. You said you needed to go buy a car, and you had $10,000. Right. We need two cars. And you have one of them's twenty three. So the $23,000 car, is is that the loan amount, or is that what it's worth? That's the loan amount. What's the car worth? Um, from Kelly Blue Book, around twenty five. So it's worth more than you owe on it? Yes. And what's your household income? About $45,000 okay. between the both of us. Yeah, you need to sell that car. You don't need a $23,000 car when you make forty. You have too much okay. tied up in car. $25,000 car. So, yeah, sell that car. and Oh, there's the $2,000. You can buy a car for $2,000 when, when you sell that car and have 2000 extra in your pocket after you pay the loan off, right? Right. Oh, wait a minute. We got to buy two cars now. But you get two 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 thousand dollar yeah. cars. Okay, so you get one. You, you know, go buy two two thousand two two three two. two <laughs> go buy two cars that are worth anywhere from two to three thousand dollars out of this scenario, and put the rest of it down to a thousand on debt. And you're driving a couple of beaters. Okay. Now your rule of thumb is you do not want to own vehicles that equal more than half your annual income. All your vehicles added together, because vehicles go okay. down in value. All of them. 
And you, if you have too much tied up in things going down in value, you can't win. Okay, gotcha. So I'm going to okay. get into two $3,000 cars. How much debt do you have? Uh, 65000 total, 23 of that is car loans, and 42000 is student debt. Okay. And then I'm going to plow through these student loans. When the student loans are gone, I'm going to build my emergency fund of three to six months of expenses. I'm immediately following that going to save and move up in both cars and get you a couple of okay. cars that when you add the value of the two cars together after all this is done, it's still not more than half your annual income and you pay cash for them. Okay, that so, sounds great. So you're going to Thank drive you these so you're going to drive these two cars that are worth 2 or 3,000 dollars for about 2 to 3 years is what it sounds like to me. That's about how long you're going to drive them, but not for the rest of your life, just for a period of time to be able to get yourself dialed in here. So, hey, thank you for calling. Open phones at 888-825-5225. So when you give the seven steps to the, the, the seven path, seven things you need to do, the path to your dream job tonight, those are in order. Mm, yes. You must, just like anything else, think of it as a climb. And so we've got to get to this stage, if you will. And then once we're there, then we're prepared and we're moving on to the next. They all work together. I must get clear first so that I know exactly the type of work that I really want to do. Yeah. And then I can say, what does it take to get qualified? Then I must get qualified before I even get the chance to actually do the work and I'm getting connected while I'm getting qualified because I can actually while I'm getting prepared I can be making connections so that when I'm ready doors are open and they're in order always in Our order baby steps are in order over in financial peace too it kind of works that way <laughs> that's why they call it number two it comes after number one this is the Ramsey show We were drawn to Christian Healthcare Ministries because we both had young families and we wanted to have more children. And we had also just started a real estate company and needed to find healthcare coverage that would meet our needs. We were attracted to CHM because of its low monthly costs and the ability to negotiate medical costs down. Established in 1981 and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, CHM is here to meet the needs of your growing family or small business. Check us out at chministries.org backslash budget. We absolutely believe in it. thinking about buying a home this year, here's a simple piece of advice that could keep you from making a six-figure mistake. Don't buy something you don't understand. And in this current home environment, this is not a, uh, this is not amateur hour. Uh, when houses are selling for more than they're listed for and there's multiple offers, putting your home on the market with an amateur is a bad idea. Buying a home right now through an amateur is a bad idea. Start by checking out our new 13-step home buying checklist, and you can learn about every step in the buying process, and you can be connected to one of our real estate ELPs. Text HOME CHECKLIST, no spaces, HOME CHECKLIST to 33789, and we'll send you the free 13-step home buying checklist. HOME CHECKLIST to 33789. Lauren's with us in Richmond, Virginia. Hi, Lauren. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much for taking my call. God bless you. I love what you do. Thank um, you. Love what you do. Well, how can we help? <laughs> um, um, we are a happy, happily married couple, 25 years, um, just about to be empty nesters. Um, and we feel like we have missed the financial boat, uh, so to speak. We um, we started out uh, ready to invest around uh, 2001 when the tech crash happened. And uh, so we uh, didn't invest in the stock market and things like that because we were concerned. We were just saved up enough money and we're getting ready to invest when the 2008 real estate crash happened. And again, we pulled back and did not invest. So we just stayed put and we just kept saving. And now all we hear is cash is trash and 
Uh, the American dollar is in trouble. Um, and we don't we feel like we have missed the boat and we're concerned now uh, that maybe we missed a way to help us retire. How much do you um, have in savings? Uh, Two million dollars. OK, I'm I'm uh, I'm absolutely amazed. And so all of this money is just money you put in there because you've never really made any money on your money. No, we've hardly made any. We have self-laddered CDs and, and done some bonds, but yeah, we, uh, basically we, your rates of return have sucked, and you still put two, got to two million dollars, and and, and, yeah. and you're still afraid to invest. Yes. Okay, but you have two million dollars. So how did you miss the boat? Yeah. Well, how big <laughs> um, a boat were you wanting to get on? <laughs> I was going to say that's no, a great no, boat. I'm, I'm, okay. But we're just, we don't know, now that our kids' stuff has been paid for, college and things like that, we just never took any time to do anything or plan for us as much as just keep our head down and work hard. And now we've picked our head up. But what what boat did you miss? You missed out on a bunch of returns that you could have had four or six million instead of two million, but you still have two million dollars. So I don't think we can really cry a river here. Okay, but when you say four or six million, that makes me really sad, but I, there's no way to fix the past. No, all you can do is think about the future, okay? So okay. Uh, let me parrot back to you what you said to me. Mm-hmm. Every time you got up the courage to invest, you found a negative story somewhere that caused you to not do it. Fear. Yes. Yes. And now your new fear is the American dollar is going to pot. That's your latest one. Yes. That's your latest one. Yes. And uh-huh. have you noticed that your other two fears didn't come true? Yes. But I don't the, like roller coasters. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah, but the roller coaster, uh-huh. even the, even with the roller coaster, it, you wouldn't have lost all your money. You would not have been broken homeless. Uh, that the 2008 real estate crash actually had almost, I mean, in the stock market crash, it came back and... You know, it went all the way down to 6,300, and it's at 30,000 Dow today. And so, you know, you missed out on all of that. Yeah, it's a ride, but, you know, you're going to either uh, not have, you know, if you had ridden the roller coaster, you, you know, you might have had $8 million. Yeah. And so yeah. even if the roller coaster screws up, it's got to really screw up to be, to end, to end up with nothing. You follow? Yes. And so I don't think that uh, I personally am not of the belief that America is coming to an end. She's got her problems. We have a whole truckload of idiots on in both sides of the aisle in, in uh, D.C. And thank God it is not up to them. It's up to people like you and me out here that get actually get things done as to how this nation runs and whether this nation works and whether we learn to treat each other with some respect out here. Uh, and, yeah. and so... You know, this all this craziness on the news cycle is just out of it's just nutty everywhere. So, but all of that said, I don't think that. I, well, I'm 60. I'm older than you, and I have 100 percent of my retirement in mutual funds, um, and a whole bunch of our wealth more than that in, uh, in in real estate that I paid cash for. Because I think in both cases they are going to go up in value dramatically more than CDs will go up. Mm-hmm. Now, are they going to go straight up? No, they go up and they go down and they go up and they go down. And can you stand the ride? So let me give you an exercise or two, okay? Because here's the thing. Okay. There's two kinds of fear. There's fear that keeps you from touching a hot stove or playing in traffic because those things will get you hurt. That's good fear. It protects you. The other fear is false evidence appearing real. Okay. And that's the fear you've been operating on. And, and I know yeah. that because, for instance, if you will pull up, a, 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 just go visit with one of our smart investor pros and ask them to show you some examples. Don't buy anything. Just go over there and start to learn. Ask them to show you examples of during these very volatile times, what did mutual fund A, mutual fund B, and mutual fund C do? And follow what they did and say, okay, had I invested in that through what I feel like were very turbulent times, I don't like roller coasters. Quote, 
here's the roller coaster ride I would have signed up for. I think you perceive it to be the world's tallest coaster, and you're going to go, oh, that's kind of like the kiddie park. When you actually look okay. at the actual history and the actual math. Listen, I don't like starting over. I went broke. I don't want to start over. So I'm not investing in stuff that's high risk either. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't like extreme volatility. I don't like high risk. I don't personally invest in any of those kinds of things. So I don't have money in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I don't play the roulette wheel in Vegas. I don't run up a bunch of debt trying to make money. I, I, I do very low risk stuff. And so I think you need to learn about the historical data on some actual real mutual funds. And you will be amazed at how much less the risk was than your emotions are perceiving it. And I think that'll help set you free because here's the deal. You're going to be fine. You got $2 million. You're going to be fine. Congratulations. You're amazing. That was an amazing task that you've accomplished. But if you keep in mind this, if it's invested at 10% rate of return instead of one, it's going to double every seven years. So when you're 64, you're going to have go two to four to eight. Oh, and when you're 71, it's 16. If it's at 1%, it's not even going to go up a million dollars between now and 74, 71. So you're either going to have 2 million or 16 million between now and early 70s, depending on how much you're willing to learn. And if you learn to drive a car, then driving a car is not scary. But otherwise, they make loud noises, and people honk the horns on them, and the, te the wheels screech. And they're really scary until you learn how to drive them. So I'm never going to learn how to drive a car. That's false evidence appearing real. Any closing thoughts? I think it's it. absolute. Well, because it was just a fascinating study in psychology there. And these are people that are so disciplined, and they're the ones that are worried about doing something stupid. I, I would just say to her, I don't think you guys could possibly do anything dumb if you go do your homework and actually learn about it. By the very nature of what they've been able to amass with sheer discipline. It was amazing. I mean, so their money, their money didn't work for them. They put all that $2 million in there. You're not going to do anything amazing. dumb at all. Yeah, the chances of you doing something extremely stupid are very, very <laughs> low. This is The Ramsey Show. Thank you for joining us, America. The Get Hired event is in just a couple of hours at 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern tonight. It's a live stream with Ken Coleman. Text the word HIRED to 33789 for your $30 ticket, and you will learn the steps to get hired. Emily is with us. Emily is in Boulder, Colorado. Hi, Emily. How are you? Hi, good. How's it going? Better than I deserve. What's up? So I have a couple questions. Um, I'm actually headed to sell my car right now, so I'm going to try to make it as quick as I can, maybe get to the second one. But the first one, um, sorry, my voice is shaking so much. Um, the first question is my boyfriend and I were currently living in his mother's basement and we are, we were planning to have enough money saved up to be able to move into an apartment in July. Um, however, with the relationship to his mother, she's now wanting us out sooner. Um, she's generously offered to pay for us to do so. But um, because of the relationship dynamic, uh, I'm just a little unsure whether or not to take her up on her offer. So one option is for her to just pay the first couple months rent. And the other option that she suggested was to, for her to buy a property 
and us to essentially pay the mortgage or to um, basically rent to own. Okay. Um, how old are you? I am 30 and my boyfriend is 27. Okay. So you're my kid's age. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm going to pretend like, um, you and I know each other better than we do and that I care deeply about your future. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, cause I do actually care deeply about your future, but we don't, you and I don't know each other that well. You've listened to me on the radio and I've talked to you for a minute and a half. All the time. But, um, we listen to you every day religiously. <laughs> yeah. And so if you've listened a lot, you probably have come across the call where I tell people not to buy properties or rent properties with people they're not married to. Have you heard that before? Mm-hmm. Yes. So it would not come as a surprise to you that I would suggest to you that this is ludicrous. It's a bad. Okay. It's a bad idea. The one I where the one where she though, buys but... a house and and wants you to be involved in buying it with her son and you're not married to him is like mm -hmm. about one of the craziest, dumbest things you could possibly ever sign up for. Please, God, don't do that. <laughs> okay. Okay, there's so many things wrong in this transaction, legally, mm -hmm. relationally, financially. Yeah. There's just, there's, this is all dumb. Please don't do that. Okay. And these are good people okay. trying to do a good thing a bad way. Sure. So, um, yeah, yeah it, it is, if she uh, wants her son to move out of her basement, uh, and she wants to help him get an apartment. Is she just going to give him some money to do that? Yeah, she's. Um, I haven't been involved in any of the conversations, but basically, what I've what I understand is that she has a certain amount of money that she was willing to give us for an apartment. Uh, we did find one, but we uh, we were going over the lease agreement and just realized that it was a really bad decision. Uh, there was like pretty much all the liability was on us, so we backed out of it last minute which is now why they are both considering this other option of yeah. purchasing, no, just, purchasing you, you a property just didn't find, You just didn't find an apartment yet. And, and you know, okay. here's what I would suggest you do, okay? And, and I, 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 I know I'm asking a, a real hard turn from where you guys' plans are, so I don't know how successful I'll be in what I'm asking. But my motivation mm -hmm. is pure, and my... Uh, experience is um, 30 years of talking to people like you, okay? Mm -hmm. So he should go get an apartment in his name, period. And if his mommy wants to give okay. him some money to get out of her basement, that's between him and her. You should not be on the okay. lease with someone that you're not married to, and you certainly shouldn't be okay. in a rent-to-own with someone you're not married to. Yeah. If you choose okay. to shack up with him and move in to his apartment that the lease is in his name, that's certainly your mm -hmm. choice. I would recommend against that, but I doubt I'm going to get that far. If I can get if mm -hmm. I can get you far enough that you're at least not signed on documents with the guy you're not married to, uh, we're at least making mm -hmm. some headway for protecting you. Okay. Because if y'all break up, no, let me try this. When you break up. And you're both on the lease. Do you know how hard this is going to be legally? Because the apartment complex is not going to let either one of you off. Yeah. Somebody's going to be in there and not paying it, and the other one's getting screwed. Yep. Please don't be on a lease with someone you're not married to. Please do not buy a house from his mother on a rent to own with yeah. someone you're not married to. You set yourself up legally, not only relationally, and we can talk about morally and spiritually if you want to, but I mean, all mm -hmm. of these other things, you're just setting yourself up for all kinds of problems, honey. And I just, I want you to win. Yeah, it was a little scary to to me, but I just wanted to hear that from somebody else because yeah. we've been getting conflicting advice from his parents and my parents. And I know ultimately it, it doesn't matter. Does what I'm um, saying make sense to but, you? Yeah. It, no, it definitely does. Okay. I'll just add this very quickly. Dave gave you a really great dad perspective, and, and I'm just going to tell mm -hmm. you, if, if I had your boyfriend on the line, you've mentioned twice that there's some tension. I'm just 
that's me kind of pulling that out. But there's a relationship issue already between him and his mother. I wouldn't take the mom's money. He needs to be a big boy. He's 27. Put his big boy pants on, mm-hmm. and he needs to go get an apartment. And I'll tell you what else, if I had him on the line, he needs to commit to you. Mm-hmm. I think Dave Dave said it mm-hmm. very well. I'm not adding to. I'm simply saying – I wouldn't. I wouldn't enter into any of this unless you're unless you know this guy's committed to you. You guys are playing house right now. You're 30 years old. I don't know, Dave. I just wouldn't take the money from the mom. Feels like that could be if there's an unhealthy relationship with my mom or my dad. Yeah, I don't I, want to take money from him. I, if Do you're you? talking to him, I would tell him that. That's what but I'm saying. I'm to talking him. to her right now. I'm just trying to get her away oh, from yeah. this. Oh, I agree. Um, you know, legally away from it, not 100%. trapped into a lease with this crazy situation. Dangerous. So, um, but yeah, I mean, and Emily, you just got to understand, I mean, Ken and I are, uh, we're considered old fashioned dinosaurs in our, <laughs> in our viewpoints on these things. But, and I, so I'm only coming at you from the legal perspective that you're going to get trapped into a lease when his mom blows your relationship up. And you'll be trapped in a lease with mama's boy and um, or a, or a young man that's at war with his mother, mm-hmm. who's a control freak. I don't know what's about to come up, but mm-hmm. this is not going to go well. This is not going to, you know, they're, 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 they're having this is this is there's issues here. And, and so please, please, please give yourself uh, escape routes. Uh, don't don't chain yourself to someone that you're not married to. Uh, this is your roommate. Argue over whose mustard it is. Don't argue over things that are going to bankrupt you uh, or, or put you into a situation that takes you five years to recover from this landlord suing you because the two of you broke up and both of you moved out and nobody paid the rent and you ended up paying it because he disappeared and his mommy's money with him. And so this is just danger, 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 red flags all over the place. And that's what I would tell my daughter, except I would take it a step or two further than I did with you uh, in terms of um, other paradigms through which we would look at it as well, uh, that we just ran out of time and can't get to. But please don't do this. This is The Ramsey Show. of the day Hebrews 12:11 no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful later on however it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it CS Lewis says hardships often prepare ordinary people for extraordinary destiny love it Open phones this hour. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host this hour. Ryan is with us. Ryan's in San Antonio, Texas. Hey, Ryan, how are you? Hey, Dave. Hey, Ken. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Sure. Um, hey, I got a question for you guys. Um, my wife and I, we've been uh, following your program for years now. Um, we've we have made it all the way through Baby Step 3, pay off a quite a large amount of debt and uh earlier this year um our house burned down oh no um we uh we had just uh is anyways we're still going through the process now you know and with insurance and all that and we actually just um we finished uh 
just last week we we had to access our uh, six months emergency fund um, to help cover some costs and all that, but we actually just topped it off again. So we're so we're back. At, we finished baby step three, and now we're on the four, five, and six. And we have a budget, and we we following we are following your steps and doing all that. The the issue is is that you know with insurance and you know with all of our contents and everything, you know, at some point we're going to come into a you know a, sort of a, a large amount of money that, to cover all these things that we lost. And honestly, we you know we don't know what to do. We're so used to just not having money and and you know budgeting and saving all this, and then. When this settlement comes and we get that money, we're we're a little confused about what to do with it. Okay. Well, it is earmarked for two things. One is to rebuild the house, and two is to refurnish it. Yes, and and I mean we have one policy which is covered for uh, rebuilding the house, and and that's sort of taken care of. And then we have a separate policy for all of our uh, to to refurbish it. Um, and uh i mean you know i don't know what that's going to be and I, and and we're so um <laughs> i don't know the word is thrifty that uh you know i don't you know i i'm not it could be tens of thousands of dollars i'm not sure but you know once we rebuild it and we have leftover money it's like or, or once we refurbish it it's like you know what do we do when you that? rebuild it and you have all the furniture in it if there's any money left then worry about it then I mean, should should it go to uh, I don't know four, five, and maybe set four, five, and six? Or, yeah, or, yeah. Or it, it'd, be, it'd be five and six if you have money left after you refurnish it. You need to take this money, uh, and you know you, you've got the building project itself, which is one lump of money. You've got the money to replace your personal loss, your personal items and furniture, and that's a different check. Am I correct? Correct. That needs to go into a separate checking account and you need to manage the refurnishing and replacement of your items as a separate project completely independent of anything else okay so just treat that money completely separate from anything else until you get the house completed and you move in it and you're done and you go okay we're done oh look there's five thousand dollars left oh look uh, we had to put money into this because we didn't have enough. Oh, look, you know, whatever, but you're going to manage it to swear. Oh, I'd like for you to rebuild. I'd like for you to refurnish the home and have a little bit of money left. If you refurnish the home, buy your clothes, buy the blender, whatever it is you got to buy. And, uh, and there's uh, a bunch of money left. That's fine. But I don't, most of the time you're not going to get enough to actually come out of this with a profit. So I think it's more emotional, Ken, to yeah. set this aside and manage it as a separate project. Yeah. Look, Ryan, you, you're a smart guy. You understand the baby steps. You've got this down pat. You guys are very thrifty using your words. When Dave says worry about it when it happens, worry. About it. there's nothing to worry about. You'll know what to do. Uh, I just, again, there's this fear that you sense over you that you're going to do something wild or crazy with it. And I don't even think that's possible. So trust in yourself. You got this. Yeah, I think you can do it. it this It's so emotionally devastating to have a home, oh. to lose your home. Because it's, it's so much of your life goes up in those flames oftentimes. And, um, and it's just, it's, it's on the list of things. That'll put you in the hospital, like the loss of a child, a divorce, mm. a death of a loved one, the uh, a bankruptcy, uh, other catastrophic personal events uh, that come into play here. And you've got one of the big ones, you know, and that's what you're facing. So, uh, you know, emotionally process that. And um, but I, I I think you give yourself permission to mm-hmm. not make money, but not go into further in the hole because of this if you came out and had zero if it was a sum total zero ken and the home is refurnished and the home is rebuilt and there's not a dime left but you didn't put any of other dimes in other than insurance money that's a complete win absolutely it is because like you said this is a traumatic situation i mean you know just to kind of reset because you can't replace yeah you just can't it feels like it's a lot of money but it's probably not 
I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I think that's probably right. When I mean, you get down into it, when you start listing out and you go, okay, we got to buy a couch, we got to buy a rug, yeah. you got to buy a lamp, you got to buy these two TVs, we got to buy a blender, and you start putting dollar amounts beside those, that money's going to go pretty fast. Yeah, even at a thrifty rate, it's still going to add up. Even being intentional and careful and managing it as a project and not being helter-skelter with it, you're still mm-hmm. got to be careful. Yeah. Alexa is with us. Alexa's in Denver. Hi, Alexa. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Better than I deserve. How can we help? Yeah, I have a question I'd like some input from you guys on. Um, so I am at a job right now. Um, I guess you could say overall comfortable, <laughs> really good pay, uh, really good benefits. Um, the you know the atmosphere, or the environment is good. Um, I feel um, appreciated. You know everything. <laughs> wow. The only reason I bring it up is because um, I am a mom of three kiddos, um, so it's a little harsh on the family. And I, I guess I'm going into about six months in this job right now. And I guess I'm starting to miss my old jobs working with kids. <laughs> um, I have kind of a really office job right now. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, I'm overall comfortable. Um, the schedule is a little tough on my kiddos. I work four tens. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'd like some input <laughs> from you guys. So you're, you uh, used to work with children in your old job? Yeah, so my my most re- I guess I've always worked with children, um, but my most recent was at a school, uh, working with kindergarten through eighth grade students. And, and now what? And now what and, do you do? I'm a court clerk. Okay, all right. Yeah. So your heart, your heart's going. You got two things going on in your heart. Number one, it's tough on the kiddos, and you're feeling some uh, maybe some mom guilt, or you're going this. I can't keep this up. This is tough on the kids. So you're starting to think exit anyway, and then thinking about that exit's got you thinking about what do I want to enter into and I think you're coming to the realization I really love working with kiddos does that sound about right I mean I think so (laughs) yeah so here's the deal so you got to take care of those kiddos so I'm I'm fine I think I think if you're asking hey is it okay to be looking yes I don't want you leaping I want you looking hey if I know that the work I want to do is with children then let's look at all the different ways that uh, you can work with kids and you've actually got a background you've got some experience and some skill set there and I would be looking to make that transition don't feel guilty about wanting to leave a job that for all intents and purposes is a good comfortable job but if you know you're supposed to be doing something else you need to embrace that and start to take the steps to move towards that but be smart about it yeah what would be the parameters that would be the dream job yes and the hours uh who you're interacting with what you'd be doing yeah. and so forth yeah yeah that, that and if you lay that out then you you'll know when you find it yeah. if you if you itemize it ken good hour thank you sir James Childs, Kelly Daniels, thank you for the show today. Great job as always. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Hey, it's Kelly, associate producer and phone screener for The Ramsey Show. If you would like to do your debt-free screen live on the show, make sure you visit theramseyshow.com and register. We would love for you to come to Nashville and tell Dave your story. 